Let's talk about updates to the most popular rating systems that we get to work in. Lead, Well, Fitwell, Grez, Briam. Let's go through some key updates here. Here's, here's our cliff notes for you as part of our challenge this week. Those are our key rating systems, but there's also some newer ones that we have to shine a light on, like the Living Building Challenge, which seeks to be the most robust and holistic sustainable building rating system available. One reason I love the Living Building Challenge is it forces us to go ahead and do regenerative design, right? We still have a lot of work to do with our buildings to get to net zero or anywhere close, but what if we go ahead and, and target the ultimate prize, which is regenerative design? So, you know, Living Building Challenge, in contrast to sustainably designed buildings, you know, regenerative buildings are designed and operated to reverse ecological damage and have a net positive impact on the natural environment. You have to be net positive water, net positive energy, net positive waste in order to go for an LBC. You know, that's for an entire, usually we think maybe commercial building, but one of my favorite projects is actually a good friend of our education company, Emmanuel Powell's, and the home that he renovated in the Spanish Pyrenees is actually a living building challenge and lead platinum home. And so you can really scale this down and just implement these best practices of regenerative design. Let's talk about LEED. I've dedicated a large chunk of my career to LEED as the primary tool for this green building movement. Fortunate to work on existing commercial buildings, commercial interiors, new buildings out of the ground, some of the newer programs like LEED for Cities and Communities. LEED at the moment is surpassing 100,000 LEED certified projects all around the world. Don't forget, LEED registered means we've signed up, but the plaque's not on the wall yet. LEED certified means the plaque is on the wall. We have either designed and built green or we've done LEED for existing buildings. That project is done certified. You know, there's over 800 million square feet of newly certified space just last year, 2022, with the LEED rating system. That's an increase of 25% in LEED project registrations over the previous year. So with the pandemic in the rear view, we're seeing LEED registrations for projects continue to pick back up. LEED recertification, which is LEED for existing buildings, you have to recertify. There was 300 million square feet of project space along with 1.4 billion square feet of existing building space that have started using ARC to track performance. Because when you go to recertify, you can do the performance path and use ARC, or you can do the certification path, LEED EB O and M, 110 possible points. Two paths to recertification these days with LEED EB. 750 policies incentivizing LEED at the federal, state, local, regional levels, with many more promoting green building strategies like renewable energy, green roofs, water conservation, and a lot of the legislation that Brian and I just discussed. The business research companies Non-Residential Green Buildings Global Market Report for 2023 estimates that global non-residential green building market size is expected to grow to $1.6 trillion in 2027 at a compounded annual growth rate of 12.3%. So this movement and the value of assets continues to grow here, all things green buildings. The global single family housing green buildings market is expected to grow to $240 billion in 2027 with an annual rate of growth of 14.7%. Green buildings are still a fantastic investment. Let's talk about how and why these ratings help with decarbonization and where they fit into ESG efforts, okay? Again, we wanna give you some cliff notes on what's changing with these programs and also has it fit into two of the newer kind of categories, decarbonization and ESG efforts. I've been doing green buildings for quite some time. And while, again, it started with more saving energy, saving water, maybe we can go for a LEED certification, it has greatly evolved to decarbonization and then overall ESG. You can't improve what you don't measure. Let's talk about some key changes to LEED. The focus had been on carbon emissions, saving energy, and getting cars off the road. With all of the versions of LEED, all the way through LEED version 4.1, our current version of LEED, if you wanted to go for LEED Gold or LEED Platinum 
It's based on carbon emission reduction. You have to save a lot of energy and you have to get a lot of cars off the road. That had been good for a long time. We have a sneak peek at lead version five coming soon where we're gonna have to start weighting a little differently. We'll talk about it, but including even embodied carbon and some other very important aspects coming out of this ESG movement. Let's talk about lead version five before I give any of you a heart attack. No, no, no. Maybe you recently passed the lead exam, congratulations. Lead version four is what your exams are still based on. Lead version five, though, will be coming. Uh, at GreenBuild later this year in September in Washington, D.C., the U.S. Green Building Council and their team and their committees have been hard at work. They're going to uh, preview, here's what LEED version 5 should look like. Best case scenario that gets voted on, approved 2024, maybe late 2024 we're starting to use this. So you've probably got about 18 months from right now, plus or minus, before it's going to show up on your projects. And frankly, that'll be the early adopter projects. For those studying with us at GBES, don't worry, your exams won't change for quite some time. So you're still good there. So I mentioned about weighting and carbon. LEED, 110 possible points in each of these LEED projects, these, these LEED scorecards. We're gonna see a little bit of an evolution to not just operating carbon. We talked a lot about that in our fall sustainability challenge and how there's also a transition to include more embodied carbon, well, LEED version five will definitely have uh, a bigger focus on embodied carbon. Um, we'll make sure we're still focused on even greening of existing buildings. But a couple of things I'm excited about, just to show you where this movement's going, is new construction will now have to be, that means prerequisite, you have to do it to get that plaque, uh, EV ready, right? They might not force you to put in all the charging stations, but you have to be wired up, stubbed up to receive electric vehicle charging. That's it. Look at all the auto manufacturers right now putting out electric vehicles. You're also going to have to make sure we have a focus on equity, which is a key part of ESG, right? There's a lot of environmental E that we have to continue to focus on, but what about the S? What about our employees, our colleagues, our communities? And so we've got to have a better focus and some points when lead points are put behind something, case in point, you know, all of these topics over the last 20 plus years of lead, when you can say, I help a lead project, I can earn you one point up to five points, that's a pretty big deal in our marketplace. It's going to get even more attention. While LEED has grown into the number one green building rating system literally in the world, <clears throat> it's a pretty tall task to have one rating system that fits all. I know uh, we've got a lot of friends at the U.S. Green Building Council. Actually, my colleague Christina, for example, was the first in-house LEED reviewer there back a long time ago in Washington, D.C. when LEED was really ramping up. I'm fortunate to be a LEED fellow. We get together once a month as a group of LEED fellows and and, and you know, we've really set out and said, hey, you ask Green Building Council, we really need you to get it right with this, 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 and this. And so let's, let's just make sure we're realistic. If LEED goes through another big evolution, it's gonna include a lot of the things um, that we think are important to our buildings, our designing, our building, and our operating of green buildings. Um, is it LEED's job to do everything? We can have that debate. Let's just see what uh, the team at the USGBC comes up with next. And what better learning than working on many lead projects? I'm so proud of our team at SIG that works on literally every one of the lead rating systems. And so we get to see firsthand how some of these points, these credits, these prerequisites apply, or maybe they're not feasible, and we can take that feedback into future projects. You know, I think all of you here as our audience this week with our sustainability challenge, if you're watching this video, you're already part of the solution. You know, maybe you're getting a sense of what you need to do to develop some new skills. Um, we may start to see more requests for design professionals who know not just how to build green, but operate green. We're starting to see that gap close. It's no longer just the designer hand it off to the contractor, hand it off to someone that's going to run the building. We have to bring all of that collaboration together better than ever. Throughout this week, you'll see we're going to show you how you can use tools like BIM to do that and just sharing of data and sharing of best practices. Will there be a greater demand for designers that go and get their LEED AP O plus M credential? Maybe so. I think that would separate you from the pack right now. 
to really know how are we going to operate this building as a green building. Part of my career, at one time I worked for Opus. That's where I cut my teeth on lead in the mid-2000s. We would have the property manager and building engineer in the design meetings. You know what, don't specify that lobby tail on our last project that failed within a year. You need that feedback earlier. You have to think like the operator. So we're seeing that shift I personally love greening of existing buildings. For us to really pull off what we need to do in this decarbonization and green building movement, we have to retrofit our existing building stock. Uh, we mentioned it earlier, adaptive reuse. You're gonna be learning more about some tools that help you reconfigure buildings this week in our challenge. With the existing building green operations, is that an area that you, maybe as a designer watching our classes this week, is that an area you wanna improve your skill set? That's just gonna be one of a few key questions we're gonna give you this week that you may wanna lean into. Well, let's hit on well and fit well in the healthy building movement a little bit post pandemic. Uh, and also just a couple of the other programs we're working in. Just wanna give you a few more cliff notes. Well and fit well, remember, came on the scene years before the pandemic. Uh, how do you design and build and operate a healthy building, right? These lights in this room right here we're recording in, you know what, if it's a lead project, we want them to be energy efficient, reduce our carbon emissions. We get points for energy efficiency on a lead project, but the natural light here, these lights are gonna affect how I sleep tonight. That's circadian rhythm, that's well and fit well. So we've gotta get back to the proactive side of the healthy building movement. Now, I think something that did net out to a positive coming out of the pandemic is most buildings, right, were forced to improve their cleaning, procedures, green cleaning, improve their air quality and filtration, and all of a sudden buildings and homes too, and, and high rise residential and churches, et cetera, schools had to do better with air quality, filtration and cleaning, right? Now I wanna challenge all of those types of buildings to get back to proactive wellness. I would argue that while well and fit well continue to grow, We've got to build back on not just the pandemic response programs, which we did portfolios at a time to get their well health safety rating, but get back to the green walls, right? Get back to the adjustable lighting, get back to the science of how do we make sure this is a highly productive space playing offense with our healthy buildings and not just a little bit of defense. And we left a lot of that behind in the pandemic, just the reactive side of things that we had to do. Again, let's get back to proactive, proactive healthy buildings. If you haven't in a while, go back to the well building standard. You can find that download, we'll put the link and go look at some of the really uh, proactive optimizations. Where can you get more points on a well project? I wanna make sure you all realize bake that into your designs going forward. So let's get back to the proactive, even more proactive side of well and fit well. Again, two programs that continue to grow. Uh, we've seen fit well pick up a new construction offering. Our team works in that, not just fit well for existing buildings. And on the well side, a lot has expanded. Take a look at well at scale, well portfolio. We've got well performance score all building on your normal full plaque well certification and your seal, the well health safety rating. So a lot more comprehensive set of offerings coming out of these healthy building programs. You know, does LEED have some competitors out there? Well, you know, there's green globes, which some projects do. Uh, there's other green building rating systems, depending on what country you're in. But at the end of the day, LEED has become the overall largest around the world, still US Green Building Council based program. But even before LEED was BREAM or BREAM <clears throat> coming out of the UK, we're starting to see more BREAM projects here in the United States, even some new construction warehouses, for example, our team at SIG gets to work on. And then lastly, how green is your portfolio? We have GRESP or the Global Real Estate Sustainability Benchmark. It's important that these portfolios of real estate these investment funds can prove by getting scored, it's optional, right? It's voluntary. How green is how we operate things, our governance? How green is it when it comes to R, E, and S, and G? Now, if you get some of these certifications like LEED, WELL, FITWELL, et cetera, BRAM, you do get additional points on your overall how green is your portfolio. So we're seeing a big increase in even the per building certifications the per building plaques, because that is now also feeding up to how are you doing as a 
portfolio of real estate. We've seen the transition from not just the environmental impact, also some governance, some of the data side of GRESP, to also include healthy building modules. And the next chapter there is resiliency. So I think pandemic hit, while we might not have used the word resiliency during the pandemic, that's what we were getting tested on. And so now we're getting back to resiliency. Yes, especially for climate related weather events. Well, we covered some of the macro legislation around this movement. I gave you some pro tips, some cliff notes on some of our most popular programs. I hope you really enjoyed day one. Tomorrow, we'll see you as part of day two of our five-day sustainability challenge.